Hey, what's up, guys? So I was having an interesting discussion with an, with an individual who was asking me about game development. And they asked me an interesting question. Do they need to be a gamer or have played many games to get into game development professionally? And I think of it like this. If you want to be a film maker, do you have to watch movies? You want to be a writer, either fiction or nonfiction? Do you have to read books? No, technically, you can do it without, but you'll be putting yourself at a huge disadvantage, you know, and it's that saying that we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and that is very much true in the game design and game development fields, because every single game you see on the market now is in some way based on a game that came before it. You know, why is that important? Because... Over this period of time, for the length of time that gaming has been a thing, certain standards and conventions have been set up that gamers now understand. It's a communication, it's a language. And unless you know those conventions, it's very difficult to make a game that's compelling to a particular market. So you have to kind of understand those foundations first. There's a lot of people who will go straight for the profession and bypass the hobby. That is to say, um, you know, they're not gamers, they have no real interest in gaming on a personal level, but they'll go straight to making games. And this is called business, of course. And you see these studios popping up often and they're always got names like, you know, some noun plus a number, like Storm 8 or Blue Wolf 9. But anyway, that's a bit of a bit of a tangent. But it kind of tells you something about the, the thought process of these individuals. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone has to make money. But for me, you know, I, I, was, I, I was brought up as a gamer. I, my first home console was the NES console. I grew up on all the early Zeldas and Marios. And why I often recommend people to look at the retro um, era for good research and good understanding of mechanics is because in that era, they had very tight constraints that they were working with. The hardware was very limited. So, you know, they had limitations on memory, limitations on audio, limitations on the color palette. So they had to be very clever with how they use their resources and still deliver a compelling product. So to do that, at least in the good examples, they had to really knuckle down and focus in on the hooks and the and the strong design philosophy because they had very little to work with so often you'd find these games that had really strong hooks you know mario one people might say well what's the hook and i guess jumping was the hook you know it, um, a lot of people don't know this but mario was initially um going to be called mr jump or was it mr video it was mr video and then mr jump or something like that but anyway yeah so it was it was always a big focus of the game Jumping has become so ubiquitous in platformers that we don't even think of it as being a hook. But at the time, it was a bit of a special thing. Like, look at this game where this character just keeps jumping. He's got the long jump. He's got the high jump. He's got the responsive jump. Because back then, not many platformers bothered with responsive jumps. The jumps were just kind of fixed where you jump and you had crappy games like Barbie and Bugs Bunny. Or maybe Bugs Bunny was good. That's the other thing, right? Not all the games from the retro era were good. In fact, out of the hundreds and thousands um, of games that came out, not all that many stood out. You know, there was a small portion that we still think of today that still influence the games today. You know, Zelda, Mario, Metroid, um, and, and a stack more, obviously more obscure ones. There's a strong foundation to be found in those games if it's looked for. But that's not to say that those games would survive today. Today, by modern standards, most students or hobbyists could probably make those games and they wouldn't be successful, you know, because design trends have changed a lot, they've uh, evolved a lot. What we know now about game feel and what um, what is engaging has changed a lot, right? So this has been a long evolution. And it's important to kind of understand that evolution and understand what makes a compelling game. And, you know, there's no golden rule for this and everyone's still trying to trying to work that out. You know, I get stuck in my own head sometimes because some of you might know I'm working on a platformer, Blood and Mead, and I'm mixing a few different things. You know, combat, there's puzzles, there's this kind of story and 
classic platforming. So it's kind of an amalgamation of um, retro mechanics sprinkled in with some modern sensibilities. And I think that's important because if you are going to use retro games as your inspiration or your muse, it's important to kind of match those old concepts up with modern sensibilities. Ori and the Blind Forest, um, Shovel Knight, these are perfect standout examples. So keep that in mind that just because a game was popular 25 years ago doesn't mean it would be popular if you re-released it today. You know, even Harvest Moon and the um, spiritual successor Stardew Valley. You know, by all accounts, Stardew Valley was a, a, a much more sophisticated game. If um, Robert, was it Barone? What's his first name? Sorry if I got it wrong. If he just straight up cloned um, Harvest Moon as it was, it probably wouldn't necessarily have been as impactful as it was. What if Robert Brown never played games before making Stardew Valley? I do believe that it is important to play games, and if not currently playing too many games, then at least have had played some games. And so it's really up to you how you feel and how confident um, you feel as to how much you have in your arsenal of, of ideas and uh, mechanical mechanics and things like that. Because, look, let's be real. When you start getting serious about game development, you have very limited time for playing games because making games takes a lot of time. Almost all my free time goes to making games or making YouTube videos about you know for you guys. But I have very little time to actually do leisure play and the times that I do play games often it's more for like research and a way for me to kind of keep up to date with with current trends and what's popular and things like that but I do still get my leisure time every now and then um, but I can afford to do that because I played so many games in the past I you know I grew up playing you know I've probably put in I'm not even sure how I'd calculate that but I've put in a lot you know and I've played MMORPGs and nearly lost my life to a few of those really but so you know I I have a, a I've seen a lot of different mechanics and you know I've seen a lot of different um, design approaches and so I feel like I have enough but I, I do feel it's important to continue uh, maintaining that in a sense it's interesting though right because you know, somebody had to make the first game. Somebody had to write the first book. And, you know, they had no one to reference. But those were pretty crude, always. You know, if you look back at what was the first game, I think it was on like a radar system in it for a submarine or something like that, where they had um, the radar and they were using it to make a game. Like, that's not a marketable game <laughs> by today's standards, you know. So you kind of need to follow that evolution. You can't necessarily just be, hey, forget all that. I don't know anything about games. I've never played a game and I'm just going to go make a game. Like, it doesn't really work like that. I mean, it's, it's fun to kind of have romantic notions of being such a maverick that you can do that, but that's typically not how it works. You know, how do we measure success? Is success all about money? If you're just making money and you're not really um, getting any real satisfaction for it outside of the money, I'm not, it's not really sustainable, you know what I mean? It's not long term, it's not going to fulfill you, and you'll probably end up being drawn to something else. And, you know, I've said that before to people when they ask me things like, oh, you know, do I really need to um, like games to make games? You know, stupid questions like that, which you, you think should be pretty obvious. Um, yeah, like in my opinion, you do, you know. You know. I had one goon in the comments telling me, like, well, what if. You just have no choice. I mean, look, game development is a specialized field. This is not a generic IT job. This is not a help desk job. You know, you're not getting pushed into game development. This is a choice. It's a specialized hobby passion field. Okay. You'll find the most efficient process if you actually have a love and passion for the craft. That's just simple and any any professional who has achieved high heights in any industry will tell you the same you got to start with the interest and the passion and the love for it and then that converts to money but anyways let me know what you guys think leave a comment below and i'll be interested to hear um, your opinion on all these things we'll see you guys thanks for watching and i'll catch you in the next video bye